talking about web accessibility today, and um, I'm curious to know who all is here. I recognize a couple of names, but many of you I don't I recognize. But just um, if you could raise a digital hand, if you are um, a web designer or web developer. Okay, so five five hands, um, and if you could maybe uh, type in chat if you are not a web designer and web developer, who you are and what your interest is in in web accessibility, just kind of general um, big picture. Okay, we've got an instructional designer who develops web-based training material, an accessibility design strategist for community transit. Awesome, welcome. And a student interested in UX design as a career. Nice. That is great. There, there are lots of opportunities in this field, certainly. Communication specialist working with web designers to overhaul a website. Yeah, so that kind of gives me gives me a general idea. CIO of the UW School of Public Health, excellent. Uh, Northwest ADA Center, shared services specialist. So it sounds like we do have uh, a variety of attendees. So I've got um, some slides I want to share initially that sort of talk generally about web accessibility and and what that means and how you measure it and what our obligations are. And then uh, I'm gonna, gonna be using a demo site that we created specifically to illustrate web accessibility. And so we'll kind of be walking through that site and just looking at some examples of what we mean when we're talking about web accessibility and, and sort of the kind of things that we need to be looking for uh, as we evaluate our own websites. So let me share my screen. Okay. So as I mentioned, I'm I'm a manager of the IT accessibility team. We are part of UWIT, Accessible Technology Services. We are here to serve the entire university, all three campuses in UW Medicine um, on technology accessibility issues. So we provide uh, consulting and support and are happy to help in any way when whenever questions arise about, you know, is this technology that I'm using or I'm deploying accessible, um, then you know, we got a team of people that, that can help answer that question. So what is web accessibility? Um, very unofficial definition, just a definition that I've come up with, is it is creating a website that works for all users and acknowledging that all users is a very broad group with a lot of different characteristics. Another definition is creating a website that complies with web accessibility standards, because there are very specific ways of measuring whether a website is accessible or not. So let's look at all users. We've got here a continuum, of people who are fully able on the right side to do a particular thing, and people who are not able, fully not mm -hmm. able to do a particular thing. And um, where somebody falls on this continuum depends on what, what function we're talking about. So if we're talking about the ability to see, some of us have 20-20 vision, or some people have 20-20 vision. I, I don't. Um, very few actually have 20-20 vision. Some people have no vision. Most people fall somewhere in between. And many of us, like myself, need assistive technology, in my case, a pair of eyeglasses that give me better vision than I would have without this assistive technology. Some people have really good hearing. Some people are not able to hear at all. 
Same thing with ability to walk, ability to read print, ability to write with pen or pencil, communicate verbally, tune out distraction, and so forth. Long list of behaviors. And where people fall on this continuum becomes a very broad scatter plot. So it's not a binary thing. You know, people with disabilities, people without disabilities. It's just that users are extremely diverse in how they how they function and particularly with how they interact with websites and the tools they're using, the configurations they're using, um, that all impacts the, the user experience. And so we need to be aware of that as we're creating websites, knowing that what I'm experiencing right now on the web is not necessarily what the next person is experiencing. It may be a very different experience. So what are web accessibility standards? Well, those are developed by the World Wide Web Consortium, at least most of them. Um, organization, uh, the W3C for short, which was created by Tim Berners-Lee, the founder of the web, um, very early on in the history of the web. It was created as an organization to kind of oversee and govern, you know, the, the, the standards and the languages that we use to create web content. And so the kind of the heart of that, the... The first uh, web standard, if you will, was Hypertext Markup Language. So HTML is a W3C standard. Another one is ARIA. Uh, that stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And that plays a key role in making websites accessible, particularly interactive websites that cannot be made fully accessible with HTML alone. So ARIA gets added to HTML and supplements HTML to make um, rich internet applications or dynamic interactive applications accessible. Uh, there's also the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, as we pronounce it. Um, that is a standard that is really important for understanding kind of where we fit and what we need to do from a, a legal standpoint. So let's look a little bit closer at that. What is WCAG? Um, it is, again, Web, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 is a particularly important version for us. And I'll explain why in a moment. But this is an international web accessibility standard published by the, the W3C. And the very first version they started working on really early on in the history of the web in the 1990s. And they had published the first version by 1998. And since then, it's it kind of was on a 10-year cadence. So 10 years passed, and then they published 2.0. Another 10 years passed, and they published 2.1. And then more recently, just last year, they published 2.2. So 2.2 is actually the latest version of WCAG. But our legal obligation, which I'll explain in a moment, is 2.1. So that's the, the 2018 version. Uh, basically, the thinking, the D Department of Justice passed new rules for the ADA recently. And the thinking was that since 2.1 has been out since 2018, then we have had plenty of time to respond to that and to make sure that we're accessible by 2.1, whereas 2.2 is new. And so they weren't willing to, you know, to go that extra step and say version 2.2 is the standard. But at the heart of WCAG, if you drill deeply into it, the deepest level of the organizational structure are things called success criteria. These are essentially the checkpoints that allow us to define web accessibility. So there are, in WCAG 2.1, 78 of those. So that's a lot. If you're new to web accessibility, it may seem overwhelming to think there's 78 things I need to keep track of to make sure my websites are accessible. Um, but these are all prioritized and they don't all apply to every website. So, you know, most, most of your sites, probably only a fraction of these apply. And we'll look at some of the highlights, you know, throughout this presentation, but they all are assigned a level, which kind of speaks to the priority. So level A are the highest priority, the most critical issues. If you don't do these things, there will be people completely shut out of your websites. Um, Level 2A are a medium level priority, and level 3A are the highest priority. If you want to be fully accessible for absolutely everybody, then you would meet level 3A, you know, meet all 78 success criteria. 
part of this uh, level assignment also has to do with difficulty. So things that are maybe important, but really difficult to implement um, fall into level 3A. And, you know, when the W3C published the standards, they recognized that this is not something that everybody's going to be do going to be able to do. So we're not going to make it a level A or a level 2A. So uh, level 2A has emerged um, as sort of the standard, the baseline. You know, if asked, which of these do we actually need to meet? Then, you know, that through legal action and through policy development, uh, level A and level 2A are sort of the baseline. And level 3A are things that we do, you know, um, to, to really go the extra mile and try to make a fully accessible site. So what is our legal obligation? This is actually new because it was just published recently, just a, a couple of months ago. Uh, the Department of Justice passed new ADA Title II rules that require um, all uh, public entities, including the University of Washington, to make sure that their public facing websites, their mobile apps, their course materials, that all needs to be accessible. And we've got a deadline of April 24th, 2026 to do that. So, so now's the time to really start getting acquainted with web accessibility. So it's great that y'all are here. And um, you know, to be working toward a, you know, fully accessible by that, that deadline. Um, and WCAG 2.1 level 2A was identified in those new rules as the minimum standard. And for more information, there's uh, there's a website that the UW Office of Compliance has published. That's kind of the, the central communication source. So as new resources become available, you know, to support people as they're working toward meeting this obligation, or you know, as questions arise about you know, does this apply to X and does this apply to Y, then that that web page is the place to go to for answers to those questions. And so um, I think uh, we can, um, the link is in the slides and maybe uh, Anna Marie can paste that into to chat. So what we're gonna look at today is web accessibility using the Accessible University demo site. So this was a site that has been around a long time. We created it in, 20, in 2002 uh, with funding from the US Department of Education um, a, a NIDER funded project called Access IT. And essentially it's three parts. Um, there's a before page, an after page, and an, a middle page, an issues page that explains all the problems that are in the before page and how to fix them. And then the after page um, implements those solutions. So this is uh, publicly available and you can you know, have a look at it after the, after the session and explore. And, you know, it's a great way uh, to learn about accessibility. And, and so I like to use it in presentations about web accessibility. Also, 2002 is a long time ago. And so it was in need of a, a refresh because, you know, the web has changed and accessibility techniques have changed. And so in 2022, we upgraded, um, created a 20, 20th anniversary edition that uh, was funded by the National Science Foundation, part of an access computing project. So uh, there are some resources here on the final slide, some things that will come up. First of all, the Accessible University demo site itself is linked from the access computing website. So you can get there through uw.edu slash access computing slash AU, the initials of Accessible University. Uh, there's our own site, the Accessible Technology website, which is our hub for all sorts of things related to digital accessibility. Lots of information there about web accessibility and an IT accessibility checklist, which can be very helpful um, in sort of you know, stepping through uh, the uh, WCAG, but paraphrased in a way that is maybe a little bit easier to understand than a technical standard. Also, we have a tools and resources page, which has links to a lot of free tools that we use to check websites. So you'll see some of those in action today. You can get a full annotated list of some of our favorites at uh, uw.edu slash, uh, Actually, it's access tech, not accessibility. Our, our URL changed, and I, I forgot to update this slide. But it's access tech 
slash tools rather than accessibility slash tools. Um, also, the ARIA Authoring Practices Guide, I won't read out this URL, but that's a key resource, which I'll talk about. And then, once again, the link to the Title II rule on digital accessibility. So I'm going to end the slide show now and show you Accessible University. So this is, uh, as I mentioned, a website that has three primary components. There are some additional things, too. Um, like files for demonstrating accessible documents, PDFs, and, and other digital document issues. Also, PowerPoint accessibility. Um, so there are a couple of slides that can be used for that purpose. And uh, there's a before page, an after page, and the, the info page, which explains all the issues that are covered. So let's start with the before page. What are some possible issues here on this page. So I'll just kind of walk through how I do a web accessibility assessment, just kind of an informal one. Or if somebody asks, is my website accessible? Um, then, you know, I'll, I'll do just kind of a high level review to see what I can find out. So first of all, you know, as a sighted user who's able to use a mouse, I will explore the, the, the website and just see what's here. And what I see are several sections of content. There's a, a graphic at the top. There's a menu. And if I hover over the menu items with my mouse, I see that it has drop-down menus. There is a carousel that has um, various slides. If I click then I can advance the slides and go through the carousel. There also are some what, what I call lentils, little buttons at the bottom of the carousel that also serve a navigational function. Um, there are the various sections have headings. There's a content that's in Spanish. There is a block of content that's in Spanish. There's a section that says, can you spot the barriers? And there it says there are at least 22 accessibility barriers on this page. Um, to see a list of all known issues, click here. To see a more accessible version of this page, click here. And for a cheat sheet of accessibility issues, click here. Uh, it's not clear whether those are links, but the word click here suggests they might be. Um, there's a table of AU enrollment trends. There's a video. And there's a sidebar that has an application, so I can apply to the university. So a few things I want to know about the accessibility of this site. Uh, first of all, because there's an image, I want to know whether that image has alt text. Because somebody who's using a screen reader does not um, have the ability to see the image, but there needs to be a description of the image or some an, a text equivalent of the image that a screen reader uh, would be able to, to read aloud. And so uh, there are a few tools that can, can be used for that purpose. One of my favorites is the Web Developer Toolbar. It's a free tool. It is included on our tools page. And it includes an images tab where I can display alt attributes. And it displays the alt attributes adjacent to any images that are present on the page. So this particular image has alt, which is the file name. That's not going to be useful at all for a screen reader user. Better alt text for this would be just the text that we see, Accessible University. It might also say logo, maybe Accessible University logo, if it's important that that's a logo but probably just Accessible University is fine um, by itself. There also are alt attributes for these graphics. It says alt equals horizontal line graphic for each of those, but those are arguably decorative. They don't have any value to somebody who's using a screen reader. So they should actually be hidden so that the screen reader isn't bothered by that additional noise. Um, somebody who's reading this page with a screen reader, just wants to um, get the content. They don't care if there are horizontal line graphics on the page, and that just creates noise. 
Um, and then there's there's actually good alt text on the Creative Commons license, but that's not really part of the um, of the web page. So let me refresh. Another thing that I want to check is headings because this clearly has headings. I would say that Accessible University, even though that's a logo, that is the main heading of the page. So that should be an H1. And then you've got a bunch of additional headings. Welcome, Bienvenido, Can You Spot the Barriers, AU Enrollment Trends. Those are all headings at the same level. And that's the second level on the page. So those should be H2s. And so this is uh, what I have in, in my browser here is accessibility uh, bookmarklets. This too is listed on our tools page. And if you click on any of these, we've got a bookmarklet for landmarks, another one for headings, another one for lists, another one for images, another one for forms. And if you click on those, then it gives you some information. In this case, it says there are no heading elements on this page. So even though there's clear visible heading structure, these are not actual headings. And that is gonna be critical for somebody who's using a screen reader because they're not gonna be able to jump from heading to heading or, and get you know a good understanding of the overall structure and organization of the website. So another thing that I will do in testing for web accessibility is to just use the keyboard. So you don't have to have tools or really any sort of um, you know special knowledge about accessibility. You just need to be able to use the keyboard. And if you press the tab key, which I'm doing now, then you should be able to see where you are and be able to navigate around and access everything that you can access without um, with, with a mouse. So. Not everybody can use a mouse. Some people are physically unable to use a mouse and they should be able to use a keyboard instead um, to navigate through just by pressing the tab key. So right now there's there is a navigation, a series of navigation buttons up in the top right that actually is uh, sort of external to the, you know, the, the example page here, but those do have good visible focus. I can tell when you know, I'm on a button, which button I'm on. But once I get beyond that, I can tab to the menu, but how should somebody be able to interact with a menu um, using the keyboard? What happens now that the submenu is exposed? Should I be able to arrow into that? Um, well, the answer to that is actually in the ARIA authoring practices guide. So that was a link that was in on that last slide. The W3C has published this resource, the APG, as it's called for short, which has a, a whole bunch of common design patterns, like menus, navigation menus, that um, you know they're common on web pages, and there is a standard recommended way that they should work. So the the APG, the ARIA Authoring Practices Guide, tells developers what ARIA is needed in order to communicate this particular widget or this user interface to somebody who's using an assistive technology. So what ARIA do you need? And also what is the recommended keyboard model? So how should this work with a keyboard so that every menu that people encounter on websites always behaves the same? That's the goal. If everybody conforms to this, this standard design pattern, then we get a similar user experience across all websites rather than, you know, sort of the Wild West where everybody creates their own keyboard model and some have no keyboard model and keyboard users are really, you know, uh, at a disadvantage because every website behaves differently. So the standard actually calls for tabbing to the menu and then tab, the next time I press tab, you should leave the menu. So tab is for landing on big objects only. So it lands on the menu and then it leaves the menu and goes to the next focusable element. And meanwhile, within this menu, I should be able to navigate with the arrow keys. It actually doesn't work that way. This menu, um, I can tab and I go to the next menu item and I have to tab through every menu item to get to the other side of the menu. And 
that's a pretty lengthy process. Um, so it can be very laborious if somebody has a physical disability. And even though they can use the keyboard, it might be difficult for them to do so and might be time consuming. So fewer tab stops is desirable. Also, when a drop down menu is open, a user should be able to press escape and that'll take them back to the, the parent menu item. So in this case, back to visitors. And, you know, that's not, this is not working. The inaccessible page doesn't behave that like that. The escape key does nothing. So, so again, conforming to standard design patterns whenever you've got any sort of interactive complex uh, component, you know, is critical. So uh, if I press tab now, I should be able to go to the carousel, but this button is actually not keyboard focusable. I can't get there with the keyboard. I can only click it with the mouse. And same thing with the buttons down below. I cannot get to those with the keyboard. So um, this carousel was not designed with accessibility in mind. And once again, the APG has a design pattern for carousels, you know, very specific recipe for how carousels should work and what sort of markup they need in order to be accessible. So when I press tab, I went somewhere else and I'm pressing tab now. And I can't, honestly, can't tell where I am. Um, now I'm on the video, it seems. But I think probably I'm tabbing through these click here links. But because there's no visible focus, I can't see where I am. So that's sort of the first fundamental of keyboard accessibility is to always have visible focus so a keyboard user knows where they are. And this is actually built into browsers. Browsers do a good job of providing, usually it's a blue border around the object that currently has focus, but it's possible to turn that off, to disable that uh, accidentally. I think most designers or developers turn it off accidentally because they don't understand the ramifications. But with cascading style sheets, with CSS, um, you, can, you can add you know, properties that, that change that behavior that is native to browsers. And the result is uh, keyboard users don't know where they are. And so that's really important to do a keyboard test and make sure that, that everything's working. Um, the video, let's watch the video and just think about who might have difficulty accessing this video and why. prepare students for careers in the 21st century. Our campus provides opportunities for students in all fields, from liberal arts to engineering. We are rich in tradition, but our students are immersed in cutting edge research. We've been ranked as one of the country's top institutions, but what we care about most is you, the student. Imagine yourself here. You'll find challenges, you'll find a future, you'll find your community. Join us. Okay, so hopefully you, you probably were thinking, well, there are no captions, right? So all of that narration is not accessible to somebody that can't hear it. And this, this video player doesn't have a CC button. So there doesn't seem to be a way to, uh, to turn on captions. So captions just don't seem to be present. But there also was a lot of information displayed visually. Um, for example, the, narr the narrator towards the end there said, imagine yourself here, and there are some visuals that accompany that. But that's not that's information that's lost to somebody who can't see the video. So, so that's an important part of video ac accessibility too, is 
you know, if somebody can't see the video, they're just listening to the audio track, is everything accessible to them? Or are there some key takeaways that they're missing that would need to be provided through uh, some other means? Um, and so we'll talk about when we look at the the after version, we see what a solution is for, for that problem, making videos accessible to people who are unable to see the video. Another issue is um, the form. First of all, it says required fields are in blue. So if you're unable to see the difference between the black text and the blue text, then you're gonna have a hard time figuring out you know, which of these are required fields. That's just uh, you know, one indication of why it's important to not use color as the sole means of communicating information. Um, the click here links is another example of that. Those are distinct in that they are a slightly different color than the black text that surrounds them. But some people can't perceive color differences. Probably all of you have some difficulty perceiving the differences in these colors, but um, it's you know maybe a little bit less pronounced on some websites, or maybe you've got blue link text and black regular text. But not everybody can perceive those color differences. And so, um, so it's important to also have an underline and not just an underline, you know, that it where somebody has to hover to see it, because that's sort of like an Easter egg where you have to try and find the text that has an underline. Um, you know, you want links to be clear um, by, by default. Uh, another thing with this paragraph, um, for a cheat sheet of accessibility issues, if I click here, then I get a dialogue that pops up and I can click the X to close that dialogue. But what happens if I'm a keyboard user? I can't click, I don't have access to the mouse. That close button doesn't have focus. And if I start pressing tab, I see that I actually am behind the scenes here. I'm able to move around on the web page, which is supposed to be unavailable. Um, but there doesn't seem to be any way at all to uh, focus on this close button and close this. And escape doesn't close it either. So I'm sort of stuck now at this point with this, this barrier that I can't seem to get beyond unless I uh, refresh the page. So very frustrating experience for somebody that doesn't have access to a mouse. So. I want to launch a screen reader. So this is JAWS. It's the uh, most popular screen reader uh, for accessing content in Windows. Um, there's another, there's a free screen reader in Windows called NVDA that a lot of users use because it's free. Uh, in on the Mac side, you've got VoiceOver, which is built into Mac OS. And so that too is free with the operating system. Uh, and iOS, iPhones and iPads also have uh, voiceover. Android dev devices have talk, talk back. So lots of screen readers out there. Uh, we'll demonstrate with JAWS what the experience is like um, navigating an inaccessible web page. JAWS. Accessible University Demo Site Dash Inaccessible Version Dash Google Chrome Dash Terrell Left Parent Up. Okay, so... Um, here on this web page, one of the first things I might do is try to pull up a list of headings. And I can I can just press the H key to jump from heading to heading to heading in a page. And that way I can, right out of the gate, when I go to a new page, I can explore the page and see how it's structured. But we saw earlier that there are no headings on this page, so that's going to be a problem. There are no headings on this page. And that is exactly what JAWS tells me. So I'm not going to be able to navigate with headings. And so that kind of puts me at a disadvantage already. But if I just start arrowing down through the page, then I can read everything from top to bottom. A 123,456,789.gif unlabeled graphic. So there's we saw that alt text earlier, uh, the file name, and obviously not not good at all from an accessibility standpoint for a screen reader user. Demo site menu navigation region. And we'll skip the menu because that that actually is accessible, but it's not really part of the list. Link, the demo. Link, list end. demo site menu navigation region end. List of four items. 
Now, this menu is a list of four items. Link about. And there is a link about. Link academics. And so each of these is announced as a link. Link about. But if I click on that link, it's actually going to take me to another page. And so there's no way for me to actually trigger the drop down. That is something that requires a mouse and is not accessible to uh, a screen reader. So again, this menu was not coded according to the W3C recommended design pattern. And so it does not have the accessibility that we need. If I go on link, 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 this, visitor, list end. carousel slash slide one unlabeled graphic. Then I've got, there are images here. Um, slide one is an unlabeled graphic. A modern tool. And I discover that there's a spelling error. Spelling errors actually are uh, important for everybody. But a, a screen reader user, you know, that it may spelling errors may jump out by the mispronunciation. Welcome. And notice that I bypassed everything there. There's no next button. There are no you know, slide one, slide two, slide three, slide four buttons. No way to interact with the carousel at all with screen reader. So here I am on the welcome section. I can do Accessible this. University left I'll jump right down to the Bienvenido section. section of horizontal line graphic graphic. Bienvenido. Accessible University left parent UA right parent S Uni University Ficticia Y S S Supagina Dofician. So if any of you speak Spanish, you may uh feel that that probably was not pronounced very well. And indeed, um this even though this is Spanish text, Jaws is not smart enough yet to recognize it as Spanish text. So that may change someday, but meanwhile, it is dependent on the code being there that identifies this as Spanish text. So um, in HTML, there's lang equals and then an abbreviation for the language. It, for Espanol, it's ES. And so that just having that attribute, lang equals ES, JAWS would recognize this as Spanish. It would switch into Spanish mode and would pronounce everything correctly. Because JAWS and most screen readers actually are bilingual or multilingual. They can they support many different languages. Uh, the can you spot the barriers? We saw all those click here links. If I press tab now, accessible university demo site dash in accessible version link click here. It says link click here. If I press tab again, click here link. Click here link. Click here link. Click here link. So three click here links in a row. So somebody might be tabbing just through the focusable elements of the page. So through the links in this case. And this is why the link <laughs> text really needs to be unique. Um, it, you know, link text should stand alone independently of context. So somebody who's navigating with Tabkey should have a better understanding of, you know, what are these links? Um, you know, where, what's going to happen when I click this? Another thing that a screen reader user will often do is bring up a list of links. So I can do that in JAWS with the JAWS key plus F7. JAWS version 2024.2406. And here, once again, I see click, click here, here click, click here, click, click here. 10 to 14. And so not at all helpful when you take the links out of context. Escape. If I horizontal line link, click follow here. that third click here link that brought up the dialogue, which we know is inaccessible to keyboard users, let's see what happens with a screen reader. Space. The dialogue, even though it appeared, it wasn't announced. And now I don't know what's happening, but if I navigate horizontal line graphic graphic, then once again, I'm still on the page behind. My focus was not placed in this dialogue. And I've got no way to close the dialog. If I'm using a screen reader, I probably don't have eyesight. Some That's not necessarily true. But uh, if I don't have eyesight and I'm using a screen reader, I'm not bothered by having this barrier in front of me. But you know, if the expectation is the user should be able to see that cheat sheet of accessibility issues, I can't see it. It's not accessible to me at all. So I'm going to have to cheat and use my mouse to close. The Accessible page. University demo site. Let me go down to the table. Because there are no headings, I have to, have to navigate this way. So with tables, um, screen readers have a special mode 
um, special hotkeys that allow them to navigate through tables in a way that associates all the parts. So when I'm on, for example, A, Ito, Fasa, CIA, Fasa, 1481, I can find out that that is last year CS undergraduate, but only if it's coded properly. So tables have to have the, the column headers marked as column headers. And if it's a complex table like this one is with nested columns, um, then you know there needs to be some additional markup that establishes really clearly the relationships between all the parts. But if I move through this now, slower. Oops. Four hundred column three, seven hundred twenty-seven column four. All I know is what column it is. It doesn't read the headers because it doesn't know those are headers. And I have to remember the column headers as I move through the table. And that, you know, the bigger a table is, the harder that is. But it, it, regardless, it's a lot of cognitive load for somebody um, it, when it could be, you know, accessible right out of the gate. Let me jump to the, t to the form. Email colon edit blank. Name colon edit blank. Type in text. So... A key with forms is the labels or the prompts for each form field need to be explicitly associated with the form field. And so this is um, you know, something in the HTML. There's a proper way to code this. And JAWS is, is unique among screen readers in that it will guess what the label is, even if it's not coded properly. So, and that's the case here, where if we were to use NVDA or voiceover, it's not going to say anything. It's not going to say this is name or the next field is email. It doesn't want to take that risk of misinforming the user. JAWS takes the risk, but let's see what happens as we proceed through this. Email colon edit, country colon edit, blank. So no far text. so good, but let's say I do want to apply to this university and I want to ma major in psychology because I'm a soft sciences person and yeah, you know, things like physics are way over my head, so I'm not going to want to do that. Engineering checkbox not checked. I Check proceed through power. the list to the psychology checkbox. Economics check, physics checkbox, psychology checkbox not checked. And I check what I believe power. to be the psychology checkbox. Space checked. And I actually check the physics checkbox. And so then I apply and I get accepted as a physics major, which was not my intention all because JAWS misunderstood the form and um, because it was not coded properly. Spats, please enter the two words you see below, separated by a space edit blank. We also test. have a CAPTCHA, which is a really frequent barrier um, for, for screen reader users. And for a lot of people, it's just really hard to figure out, you know, what, what exactly is this? Even sighted users... Yeah, this was an actual CAPTCHA that I grabbed off of a website that seems to be asking for negative 72.9 degrees. And what is that degree symbol? How do I get that? Um, I guess it maybe it's an O, but really unclear. And then really unclear what the, the ink blot is next to that. But uh, impossible for somebody who's using a screen reader because they can't see that image. And you can't just add alt text to that image because that would make it accessible to bots. So um, CAPTCHAs are a difficult problem to solve, but there are um, solutions. So I'm going to uh, close JAWS, Unloading JAWS with Enter. and I take a quick look at the more accessible version that has solutions for all of these problems. So first of all, if we look at headings, now we see, using the accessibility bookmarklets, that this is an H1. All of the things that I said should be H2s are in fact H2s. So we have really good heading structure and that is gonna dramatically improve the, improve the experience for screen reader users. The If I do a keyboard test, then I can, first of all, there's a skip to main content link. So that's nice too. I can jump right past the navigation and go to the main content. But the, Navigation menu, if I press enter on any of these drop downs, then I can use the arrow keys to move up and down. And I can press escape to go, you know, back to the, the uh, button that triggered the drop down. 
I can use right and left arrow to move through the menus. So this is a well-designed menu, works really well for keyboard users. I also, I didn't mention color contrast, but color contrast was a big problem in the before page uh, in several places, including in these drop-down menus. Also, now I can go to um, these buttons, the before, the, the previous and next buttons are accessible with the keyboard. And uh, contrast was also a problem on the carousel. Uh, it, it, some of you may have noticed that the text was really hard to read on some of these slides. And so here we've got a semi-transparent background behind the text that makes the text always easy to read, even with uh, you know, the, the photographs. We can also access you know, each of the buttons. And so another way to move through, through that. Um, the click here links have been uh, rephrased so that they don't say click here anymore. They have a brief description of what exactly is you're going to go to if you click. So there's an info link and there's an inaccessible version link. And that cheat sheet, the short list of accessibility issues, actually wasn't a link at all. It shouldn't be a link. It's a button because buttons trigger things happening on the page, like the display of a modal dialog. And when we use that now, the close button has focus by default. And so we can, we can close it when we're done, or we can press escape. And when we do so, focus goes right back to the button that triggered it. If we uh, watch the video now, we have captions as a CC button, but let me just watch a little bit of this. So even though this is captioned, there's still a lot of content here. Well, right now we're just listening to music if we can't see the video. So somebody who is blind really needs what's called audio description. And in this case, we have a description track that can be turned on. And when we do that, then we get narration that accompanies the video. So not everybody is going to need that. But if somebody turns it on, then they get audio description, which describes all the visual components. So let me restart the video now. On a white background, a logo appears, Accessible University. An old brick building is covered in ivy. Students walking across campus. Students sitting on a green lawn beneath giant trees. So all of that um, you know, communicates the essence of this of this university. And so this is a marketing video, right? It's intended to communicate how wonderful this university is. And if somebody can't see it, they need to get that same message. And so audio description does play a critical role in making that communication possible. Um, this player, by the way, is a player that we developed. It's called Able Player. Um, it is a, a free open source media player that was built uh, specifically to support uh, accessibility in, in all of its uh, forms. Um, let's go to the uh, the form. And uh, let me just tab, tab through that. I can click. There we go. The CAPTCHA, in this case, the one solution that we implemented is a, an alternative CAPTCHA. It's a text CAPTCHA. Sunday, cow, Friday, which of these is not a day. Um, that you know is fully accessible. Anybody can solve that. But historically, bots have had a difficult time solving something like that. That isn't so true. The bots are getting smarter and smarter. So this may not be a great solution now. But there are other solutions out there, you know, that are more accessible. Um, that still, yeah, you know, it's an ongoing problem keeping the bots out. Um, but also providing an accessible interface, or better yet, keeping the bots out completely behind the scenes, um, it, which Google reCAPTCHA version 3 does without burdening the user with having to, you know, answer silly questions or, you know, pick, um, you know, photos out of a lineup and, and that kind of thing. So real quick look, I'm running out of time, but I want to run a screen reader demo 
just uh, so you can see the difference between the before and the after. JAWS, Accessible University Demo Site, Accessible University Demo Site Dash Accessible Version. So if I hit H, univer Accessible University Editing Level 1 Graphic. First of all, I read the graphic with the right alt text, so that's wonderful. I press H again. Welcome, Editing Level 2. Jumps between the headings, so I can really easily navigate through the page. I'm now on the Bienvenido section. And it now is pronouncing that with really good Spanish because it's properly tagged with just that really simple um, tag solution. If I uh, jump to the short list, of accessibility issues opens in a dialog button to act. Actually, tells presenter. me it opens in a dialog because of the code behind the scenes. Space accessibility issues dialog close dialog button to activate presenter. And so that was identified as the accessibility issues dialog because it's properly coded, and I can read the content. List of twenty-two items. Notice that it's a list of 22 items. This is why it's important to mark up lists as lists, because that information is communicated to screen readers. One, missing landmark regions. Two, no headings. Three, language not specified. So I could read the entire list. I can press escape anytime. Escape, main region, short list of accessibility issues, opens in the dialog. And now I'm back on the button that where I left off. Um, if I jump down to the table with a T, table with eleven columns and four rows, the file last year. It is. This is uh, marked up properly for accessibility. This Computer science. One thing is, all those cryptic acronyms are spelled out uh, using the abbreviation tag, and so now it's announced as computer science, English, English, economics, economics. physics, psychology, computer science, so forth. And, and if I jump down into the numbers. Last year English, 400, column 3. Last year Economics, 727, column so, 4. So a much better experience because this is marked up properly, and now I don't have to remember which columns are associated with which column headers and, and all of that. I can just navigate and read the table in the same fashion that a sighted user would. So I jump up to the form. Play button. Video play button restart video. I have to go through the media player first. Apply now. Com in country colon edit. Black desired major left parent and e physics checkbox notch psychology space. I check. can now uh, major in psychology without worries because the this form is coded properly. If I submit the form and get an error, Spanish I didn't demonstrate box. this on the before submit page, button. but security question group submit an error colon name is required. On the previous form, that message, an error, there's an error. It just said there's an error, but it didn't you know, explicitly tell me uh, what the error was. In this case, this is coded in a way that announces the, that error message and places focus in the first field where there is an error. So I can immediately correct that. So a much better experience overall. Um, and... If you wanted to, to study more, again, the Accessible University demo site includes an to... info page Accessible that describes page for all of the issues Unloading jaws. that are found on this page and, you know, with explanations as to, you know, what the problem is and what the solution is. So I encourage you to, to check that out or to reach out to us if you have any uh, uh, questions. So, with just a few minutes left, are there any questions that folks have from, I'm looking at the chat now, if you have new questions that you've not um, pasted in the chat, feel free to just unmute and, and ask, or maybe raise a hand and I can call on you. We did have one question. Um regarding keyboard and menu operations mm -hmm. it says i'm using the pattern described at and it's the um link to the aria authoring guide for the flyout keyboard part which is different from the behavior you just described using arrow keys is there a right choice that that is excellent i'd have to look at that specific example um there are some inconsistencies within the W3C, and they're trying to rein that in. But I would trust the APG first. 
Um, and the the tutorials that are that appear on the W3C site are working to get in alignment with the APG recommendations. And so that would be my first source is uh, the, the APG. <laughs> Cry, but thank you. Yeah, it's un unfortunate. Um, but but at least we're I think we're moving in the right direction of having you know a source for for standards and there there also are some things that are not covered in the APG you know design patterns that we run into all the time that are um, you know just they haven't been addressed yet and so then we have to figure out well what what makes sense um, and there are a variety of sources that I consult in order to try and figure out what does the community think makes sense uh, for this design pattern rather than going uh, going it alone i think it's good to consult the community and just see you know where is this headed and so anytime if you run into that please feel free to reach out and we can help you know facilitate that that quest for the the truth if there is such a thing okay uh, one additional thing, since we're talking about web accessibility, I didn't add this to the resources page, but um, or the resources slide. But if you go to uh, uw.edu, I'm typing this in chat. Access tech slash events, then you can see all of our upcoming events, and one in particular. Uh, for people that are interested in web accessibility is our monthly web and web accessibility and usability meetup happens every uh, this Thursday. So whatever that is, second or third Thursday, I forget which one we're on. I think it's the second um, 10 a.m. And it's just an opportunity for sort of peers to share designs, things that they have questions about and to um, you know participate in a conversation about about those those things and explore together, you know, what is uh, the best way to code, you know, something or what are the implica implications of, of a particular design? So uh, this month we're going to be looking at cards. So a card interface, we've got a few examples we want to look at and want to just raise some questions about, you know, what is the best way to, to code this and what is the user experience like? So I encourage if you're available, I encourage everybody to show up for that as well. It's a great casual time to explore web accessibility together. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate you coming today. And hopefully you, you learned a few things, picked up a few tips.